Well, today we start second to last chapter. And then next week we do the last chapter and the final exam. You guys ready to be done? Where'd Andrew? Not here, apparently. So, oscillatory motion waves. What is oscillatory motion? Motion that goes back and forth between two points. It's caused by a force that continues to pull the object back to the middle point of the system, or what we call it. It's more appropriate to call it an equilibrium point. And here they they have some different uh, waves being represented in this picture. Light is actually a kind of wave. It's an electromagnetic wave. Different kinds of light here. You have waves on the river here. You also are going to have waves in the singing and the playing of the guitar and the sounds all around. Them. Those are all waves. Waves are caused by a disturbance in the material or in space somehow. In the case of like uh, water waves, it's a disturbance in the water that when it tries to go back to where it was disturbed from, it creates a disturbance next to it. And that's why if you drop a, a drop a rock in the water, first you see this big wave in the middle and then you see a bunch of little waves propagating outward. Those little waves propagating outward are, that's the water next to the wave that was created by the disturbance being disturbed. And then, then the water next to that gets disturbed, and the water next to that gets disturbed. And that movement is called the wave. Now, I, I say movement with great emphasis because the water doesn't necessarily move side to side. It usually mostly just moves up and down. Have you ever been in a wave pool before? It's in the wave pool, kind of towards the middle, and you're pretty much just going to go up and down. As you get towards the shallow end, you get a little bit more movement back and forth. But, you know, many waves have this up and down movement that um, doesn't really take you anywhere. It just takes you back and forth between one pot. There's an oscillation, in other words. Whereas the wave travels off somewhere else. So you're not necessarily moving along with it. So there's kind of there's a lot of complexity and subtlety to waves. Let's start with some very simple disturbances in materials. So here we have a piece of metal or plastic or whatever. It can be a ruler, it can be a pencil, it can be a whatever. And if you bend it one way, it actually tries to pull itself back against the direction that you bend it. So if you bend it to the left, the material is going to try to, to spring back towards the right. And if you try to bend it towards the right, it'll try to spring back towards the left. If you bend it towards the left and let it go, then it will spring back towards the right. But as it goes through the middle point here, which we call the equilibrium position, it's going to have a whole lot of velocity, or more velocity than it had over here, which was zero. And that velocity is going to, of course, carry with it momentum, because this object has mass. And so this object is going to not stop at the equilibrium position in the middle. It's going to keep going past it beyond it and then to another point on the other side where it's trying to pull, where this material is trying to pull it back towards the center again. Then it'll go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And that is what I'm going to call oscillatory motion. The force that is pulling it back towards the center position all the time is what we call a restoring force. And um, uh, hook who described the stretchiness of materials and the squishiness of materials using this very simple model of uh, the force of the, 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 like a rubber band pulls back on you with is negative, is, is uh, proportional to negative the, the length that you pull the rubber band. So if you stretch out the rubber band twice as much, it pulls back twice as hard. In other words. 
And so Hooke's law looks like this force equals negative kx, where k is the spring constant. It tells you how, some, how, much, some, how difficult something is to stretch, essentially. And uh, sorry, x is the distance that you stretch from the equilibrium. So if you have an object, a piece of mass on a spring, and you pull on it, pull on it to x equals 2, let it go, it'll go up and down, up and down. Pull on x equals 3, it'll go up and up and down, up and down. But there's going to be some differences. For example, the distance that the first one travels is going to be less because you pulled it down less. The distance that the third one travels is going to be more because you pulled it down more. The speed that the third one uh, over here travels is going to be dependent on the force of the spring and the mass of the object. So you'll have to figure that out because that will determine the acceleration and the speed and it will also be time dependent. So lots of different things are Let's see if we can't use, uh, we've, we've done something like this before using Hooke's Law to do a real world problem like this for springs in a car, right? So here you have a car wheel and behind this orange brake disc or whatever it is, there is a spring. The spring allows the car to bounce up and down when it hits bumps on the road, right? So, before anybody gets in the car, we're going to say that the springs are not compressed or stretched. We're going to say that they're equilibrium position. Once the 80, per, 80 kilogram person gets in, we're going to have a 1.2 centimeter compression in the springs. And we want to figure out what is the spring constant of those springs. Well, spring constant tells you how much something, you know, how, how hard it is to stretch something or squish something. And it's this law, F equals negative kx, where k is the thing we're looking for, x is the distance we compress, which is the 1.2 centimeters, and F is the amount of force applied. Well, we know the weight of the person, so that's going to be the force applied, but we know the mass of the person, we multiply by g to get the weight of the person. The weight of the person is 784 newtons, and then we're going to multiply by the negative 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2, which is the 1.2 centimeters. We get 6.53 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter for the spring constant for that spring. In truth, that spring constant is going to split up, be split up into like four pieces, one for each spring on each wheel. And we've already dealt with energy with springs. Um, the potential energy that is stored in a spring is equal to one half times the spring time constant times the displacement of the spring squared or the compression or stretching of the spring as you try to uh, store energy in it. So we know that. That was something we used already. And we've done. Sheesh, I haven't really done so much. We've done problems with this where you have an object that is compressed on a spring, and then the spring gives that object kinetic energy. The potential energy in the spring becomes the kinetic energy in the bullet in this case, right? So here's the potential energy of the spring, here's the kinetic energy of the projectile. Set them equal to each other and solve for the velocity and you can get the speed up of the um, projectile coming out. So the reason that we can make sound with instruments with strings on them is the strings create a wave uh, there's a wave that's created on the string when you pluck the string, and then within that wave, it pushes the air around on that wave. As the air gets pushed around, it has waves starting running through it, and then we usually capture those waves somehow. In an acoustic guitar, we ca capture it in a cavity, like a big hole inside of a box, and then that cavity resonates with the sound and gives us some really nice sound. In the case of an electric instrument, we use either metal strings or metal little clips on the strings, and those metal things on the strings actually vibrate back and forth past what we call pickups. And the pickups are little coils of, of wire that um, when a magnet goes over them or something magnetic like this, like a wire, um, it creates a change in the current of the pickup. And so that change in current of the pickup is carried to the amplifier and amplified up and makes sense. Hmm. 
with when you start getting periodic motion, that motion that goes back and forth and back and forth, up and down, up and down, whatever else, round and round, round and round, so that you always end up in the same place later, and then the same place again later, and so on and so forth. We can associate that with a wave. And waves have frequencies which tell us how many wave how many waves are passing a single point in in time in one second. So frequency is essentially measured in cycles per second, and that's what we call the hertz, one cycle per second. So they use that equation to calculate the frequency of ultrasound, the frequency of uh, they do that to capture the. So this is the frequency for ultrasound, well, medical imaging devices. Yeah, for ultrasound. So they tell us the period is 4.4 microseconds. Free period of the oscillation, oscillation is one over that. So here we go. But for part B. They want us to calculate the period from uh, they give us the frequency, so they want us to calculate the period. Of course, the period is just one over the frequency, one over 264 hertz. It is 3.79 times 10 to the minus 3, or 3 plus 79 seconds. So again, we're not we're not really going back into stuff that we've learned before, but talking about it a little bit, but certainly not in the depth of mathematics that we've dealt with before. There is a particular type of harmonic motion or oscillatory motion that we're going to study called simple harmonic motion. And simple harmonic motion really is just that. It's a very simple motion that usually has to be very small in order for it to work well. But this very small motion um, always is going to have a uh, it's always going to behave according to a particular mathematical function. And that mathematical function looks like this. So if you're measuring the distance of the object away from the center point, then you take the maximum distance times the cosine of 2 pi times the time that you want to know it at, divided by the period, and you're good. If you want to know the velocity, this is the equation you use. If you want to know the acceleration, this is the equation you use. All right? And these sines and cosines and things have functional um, they have they have a, a functional look to them that is very unique. So if you have a, a sine, it starts off at zero, it goes up and comes down and goes up and comes down and so on and so forth. And so if your wave starts at the zero point and then goes outward then you want to use the cosine for calculating x. x will equal x cosine and so on and so forth. Okay. However, if it starts at a distance away from the center point, this is, represents your center point. This represents pulling the spring out as far as it will go and holding it there. So if, what if you start out here? Right? What if you have this little shift in your motion? Well, then the cosine doesn't work necessarily so well. It might be the sine. You might find it different. Okay, so here they show an interesting kind of picture. They actually do make a machine like this so you can visualize it, but it's so expensive it's not worth buying. So you have all these different masses on springs bouncing up and down, and you can see that they form kind of a wave, up and down, up and down, up and down. Right? If this was the case, then right here at the beginning when it's been pushed up, it would be at its highest position, x. And then when you released, it would go down through its center point, right here, x equals zero, and then down to its lowest uh, point which is negative x, negative big x. So those two things are your uh, are the top and the bottom of your graph or the top and the bottom of your motion here. 
x, negative x, x, negative x, and this is the zero point. Notice that the, if the position starts, this, so this position right here is starting with a cosine. You can see that it does because it starts at positive x and goes like this. This one, obvious, so, so this first one is a cosine, but the velocity, since the first one is a cosine, is going to have to be a sine. It has to switch every time. Cosine to sine, sine to cosine. Just like it does here, we start off with cosine, we go to sine, and then we go back to cosine. But notice that we started with a positive in front of here, then we ended up with a negative in front of the velocity and a negative from the acceleration. So if your first function is positive, then your next two are going to be negative. Your first function is negative, next two are going to be positive. Some kind of, there's patterns to look at here. I think we've covered everything there. Hmm. Tired today. Another type of oscillatory motion is the simple pendulum. And this, of course, you just pull to the side and then let it go. And because you pull it to the side, the string is trying to pull it back towards the center. And gravity is trying to pull it down, and the overall effect is that it gets pulled sideways like this, right? And you can see the diagram here for this. This is a tilted axis diagram. Sure. So, um, if you, have a, if you have a small angle compared to your movement, then the pendulum behaves like a simple harmonic oscillator. And what that means is that the force that is required to move the simple harmonic oscillator from the center position up to some angle theta is about negative mg times theta. It's not exactly, it's pretty close. Um, Yeah, so here, if you take if you take what we learned earlier, the um, the definition of the arc length. So this s is the, is a piece of length along the edge of a circle. That's going to be equal to the uh, angular momentum times theta, which means theta equals that arc length over angular momentum or linear momentum. Right? No, that's angular momentum. What is that? No, sorry. They're using L for the radius, and I'm not thinking it through. So this is actually the radius of the circle, L. And if you solve that here for theta and then plug it into this equation, you get this equation. Force equals negative mg times S over the distance from the center of the circle to the outside of the circle. That's great. In the end, you get this equation here. And this starts to get really interesting because at the end, you have that the period of an oscillator that is a that is an amp that is a um, an pendulum doesn't care about anything except the length of the pendulum and the gravitational constant. In other words, you can actually make a clock that ticks every second just by getting the length of a pendulum just right. Because all it cares about is the length of the pendulum and force of gravity. For of course the Acceleration due to gravity is always the same, so we're good. But what does this mean? This means that you can make a clock and you can adjust it fairly easy. How many of you have seen kind of the inside of a grandfather clock? No? Kind of. So inside the clock, you have a bunch of things in that little cabinet. First of all, you have some masses in there. You lift those up to the top and they gain potential energy. And as they go down, they lose that potential energy, and that potential energy is turned into mechanical energy inside the clock. But there's also a pendulum swinging back and forth, and that pendulum has a big thing on it, a big mass on the end of it that can move. The pendulum can be shortened by moving the mass up, and it can be lengthened by moving the mass down. If you move the mass up, your seconds will become shorter. If you move the mass down, your seconds will become longer, and people who have 
have grandfather clocks know that they have to constantly be checking the time on them and adjusting that pendulum to get it just right. Now here is a famous clock. Maybe the most famous clock in the world, Big Ben, with a dragonfly. Anybody know where Big Ben is? Big Ben is in London. It's at one end of the government building of, uh, of England. So Big Ben sits at one end of the building, the other end of the building. Uh, has I think the House of Lords in it or something. I think it's the I think the clock is over the House of Commons. But anyway, that's what Big Ben looks like from the outside. This guy right here. But on the inside, this is what the pendulum looks like in Big Ben, including all these things that are stacked up on top. And these are different things that people have put on top of Big Ben over the years, decades, over a century in fact now, to make sure that Big Ben is going just the right time, so that it's clicking at just the right rate, and that also, when its bells go off, you know it's three o'clock. It's not a second before, a second after. Well, these things help them fine tune that. If you just put a little coin on top, it's kind of like it's shortening the pendulum because it's like raising the mass in the pendulum just a little bit. And that can adjust the clock just enough to make it just right. And if you need to make it go a little bit, fa a little bit faster, then you just go ahead and actually it's a little bit slower. You need to go a little bit slower, then you take one off and shorten the pendulum. Sorry, uh, lengthen the pendulum. The first time was shortening the pendulum. So. But these things, some of these things have been on here for hundreds of years, maybe. So here they're going to actually measure the period of the pendulum. They're actually going to measure the acceleration of gravity from the period of the pendulum. So they have a pendulum and they start swinging it and they time how long it takes for it to go from one end back all the way to the other end back to this end. And that's the period. Then they're going to use that period in this equation to calculate g. So they solve for g and then they plug in the period and the length of the pendulum and they get 9.828 meters per second squared. And it's actually a really good way to measure gravity. You can get really good measurements this way. And this is actually how they actually measure, uh, they actually measure the weight of people in space or the mass of person in space. They have to constantly monitor your mass. And so what they do is they put you in a chair that's an oscillator. It's kind of like a pendulum. And this oscillator will, will rock back and forth and rock back and forth, rock back and forth. And that one is actually dependent on the mass of the object. This one's not dependent on mass. Pendulum has no, doesn't care what mass is on the end of it. However, this other object does. So if you have more mass, you have a longer period. You have short, less mass, you have a shorter period, and they can calculate very, very uh, particularly and figure out your actual mass. So what happens if we plug energy into this situation? We know the potential energy of a spring, for example, and we know that if you add the kinetic and potential energies, they should be constant. So if we do that here, we get this constant. But what if we replace the v with angular velocity and the x with angular measurement? What are we going to have to do? What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to plug in some corrections because, remember, going from linear to rotational, requires that you have R's, you have radiuses of things. They're going to use L's instead of, of R's, but they're going to have it there. So it's like we're pretending this thing's going around and around a circle, but it's not. It's just going back and forth. But that's very similar to going around and around a circle. And then we, get, when, then we go ahead and use this, uh, this new kind of rotational math that we've been using. And you can see here in the end what it looks like. So here's an example. Here's an example of the before and after. You start off with some potential energy. You have some kinetic energy. 
and then you end up with just potential energy. That's like a pendulum that's swinging up to its highest point where it's going to stop and have no kinetic energy. Right? Or it's swinging down, actually that, that's an example of where it's swinging down from a spot through the center so that it has no potential energy and a lot of, a lot of kinetic energy. Either way, if you solve this, you actually get an equation that helps you to figure out what the velocity is of an object with a spring constant of k and a mass of m. And if you know, um, if you know the, sorry, what is this? We know the total distance. So this is the distance displaced, right? What did I just say? I don't even know what I said. That you can calculate the velocity, you know the spring constant, you know the mass, and you know the total distance displaced. Yeah. I'm brain off on a tangent there. Just thinking about something else. Uh, so here we have the angular version of this. If you have something that's going around and around a circle or that it has some angular velocity to it, some omega, so if you want to calculate that angular velocity, then it ends up being the square root of g over l theta. And guess what? Things that go around in circles, that's kind of like a pendulum. A pendulum rotates back and forth. And so this would actually tell you the rotational speed of a pendulum. If you know what angle you're at, you know gravity and the length of the pendulum. So the maximum speed of an oscillating system. In this case, we have a car hits a bump and starts bouncing up and down. Right? What is going to be the speed of that bumping up and down? Well, we just plug it in. We have our spring constant of our springs from the previous example. We have the mass of the car. And we have the x, which is how far it moves. And they, they tell us that it moves with 0.1 amplitude. Amplitude is the word for the maximum displacement of an oscillating system. Calculate your Vmax right there. You're good. Well, it just so happens that circular motion is a type of, um, of oscillatory motion. It just doesn't go back and forth. It goes around and around and around, right? So here's a great example of how this is true. If you have, you have, this, um, you have this apparatus where you have this turning table, this turning device that's rotating around and around here, and you put this ball on it, and then you shine some lights from above so that the ball casts a shadow down here. Ground. And as you look at the shadow on the ground, the ball just looks like it's going back and forth, just like an oscillator on a spring or you know, a ball on a pendulum. But in reality, it's going around and around and around. And in simple harmonic motion, this absolutely does come, this does come through. And so if, you're, if you actually want to calculate it out, you can do so. You can do it by calculating the position of this point P as it moves around the circle, which is what they're going to do. And the first position is going to be the, the maximum displacement, or the amplitude, which is, in this case, the radius of the circle, times the cosine of theta, whereas that's the angle. Right? Okay. Then the theta can be converted into um, omega, because theta is equal to omega times time. So they go ahead and do that right there. And then omega times time can be converted back into uh, some kind of a linear thing by using our linear to radials or linear to rotating stuff again, where you have 2 pi over the, I'm sorry, two, well, 2 pi is the distance that you're going to travel around in radians to go around once, right? So 2 pi radians to go around once and then divide that by the time that it takes to go. And there's your angular velocity just from the definition of angular velocity. So you get an equation that looks like this. x of t equals cosine 2 pi little t time over the period. The variable in here is the time. So this will tell you where the wave is if you've lost it and it's just going off out there somewhere. You know how long it's been going. You can plug in the time and get that here. Plenty of waves like that in the universe. Every time you turn on the light, every time you speak a word, those waves that you've made wander out into the universe around us and just kind of keep going. They become very, very small the further they wander, but they just keep going. And it turns out from the geometry, you can also calculate 
the velocity of an object in simple harmonic motion if you know the maximum velocity and the, the displacement or the maximum displacement called the amplitude and where it is in the amplitude at that moment. So if you know where the ball is going back and forth and you know the maximum velocity, you can use this for me to calculate the velocity at that moment in time. And you can even calculate the period and the maximum velocity and x over the maximum velocity and everything else. You've got all these equations here you can use to calculate these things, so you just use one and plug it in. All comes from wave mechanics, a very heavily studied subject in physics. In fact. And that takes us about to where we want to be done for today, believe it or not. It's uh, pretty quick. We don't, we, well, next time we'll, we'll cover these last five sections. Um, No, let's just go ahead and cover the rest of them today. We're running early enough, and then we'll just send you off to do homework. We'll do a test. We'll do a quiz. Uh, sorry, we'll do a lab tomorrow, and then we'll answer any questions you have on Wednesday. Let's take a look at our calendar real quick. Should be one homework due this week. Yep, one homework due next week, and then our final exam. So. We can if you want. Um, Essentially, to review for this test, you, I'm going to open up your uh, previous exams so that you can look those over, because that's where about two-thirds of the problems are going to come from. The last third of the problems will come from these last few chapters. So what is damped harmonic motion? Well, damped harmonic motion is just what it sounds like. It gets dampened by something. And usually, but I mean, what we're talking about is something that applies a force and removes energy from the system. So instead of having this uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy just equaling the change in those equaling zero all the time, there's going to be some non-conservative work in here, some friction usually, or something like that, something that draws energy away from the oscillator um, and, and back off somewhere else. And when that happens, your wave starts to get smaller in amplitude. So the amplitude represents the size of the displacement of your wave. So that's what you've got here, this amplitude dying off over time. Then there's two kinds of, there's really three kinds of oscillators, but here we're showing uh, two of them. Like, oh no, is there a third one in here? No, I see a third one. I thought there might be a yellow one in there. But anyway, but there's, there's a couple kinds of damping that we're going to talk about. An overdamped oscillator is A, where it damps down very quickly before the, the oscillator even gets a chance to, um, to go through one cycle. So it won't even finish one wave before it's damped out. And it's kind of going away. Then there's a critically damped one, which maybe you get, you, maybe you get way one or two or three or four, or even maybe a hundred waves in there, but eventually it's just going to damp it down. Two different kinds of damping. And... Here they talk about damping as a um, frictional thing. I don't think we necessarily need to know how to do that. But in this case, um, you use this equation here where the non-conservative work is done by friction. So you set, in your, you set your friction force in here with the distance that it acts to create the friction, where the work done by friction. And then that has to equal the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential. Remember that change means final minus initial. Okay? So if it damps it down to zero velocity, that means you have zero kinetic energy at the end. Okay? And you have potential energy being stored in the spring all the time. Okay, so here we go. Forced oscillations are probably the opposite of damping. You essentially add a force in at just the right time to keep it going. This is what happens when you're swinging a kid on a swing. 
you step in right and right at the right time and push them. When do you push a kid on a swing? Do you push them as they're coming towards you? No, then they pop out of the swing, right? Do you push them as they're running away from you? If you wait too long, what happens? Then they get too far ahead of you and then you fall over or you run forward and then they come back and hit you in the face or somewhere else, right? Um, so you have to do it just right. And usually the best time is right after it is stopped at the height of its motion in a swing. And as it's turning around to go back, you just kind of help push it back off in the direction it's trying to go in, right? So in other words, as it's going one particular direction towards the end of its motion and changing from one direction to another, you want to push it in the direction that it's changing to, uh, kind of at the same time that it's accelerating because of other forces. And that is called a forced oscillation. From forced oscillations, you get what we call resonance. Resonances occur when you get a wave that is quite small building on itself because as the wave builds up, it actually builds up right on top of the wave that you just created and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. Right. That's what happens with jump ropes. You have two people swinging a jump rope, and if you get it just right, both of you are swinging at just the right time, you get a nice big wave in that jump rope so you can jump on it. However, if you're not swinging together and you're swinging off a little bit and you're swinging really, really fast, the thing's never going to get big. You can't make a big jump rope that's big enough to get under without having a nice, slow right, movement. So there's, there's a lot to be said for matching the, os the oscillating force with the actual uh, oscillator. Well, if you do get one of these runaway cascade effect uh, ampli uh, amplifications, then this is what it's going to look like. You're going to get something, you're going to get this really tall peak at a particular frequency that works really well. Nothing else will work really well. How many of you have, um, how many of you have been in your bathtub and you, oh, and you notice that if you just move your hands up and down at just the right speed, you can get really big waves going, like when you were a kid, right? You do it just right, or you're in one of these small above ground pools and you got a big tube, you go up and down just right, you can really get things going, get huge waves going. And that's because each wave that you create, each new wave that you create, is bouncing off of walls and bouncing and going through other waves and building up each wave so that the wave peaks are on top of the wave peaks and the wave troughs are on top of the wave troughs and it just gets huge. And that's when you get this very, very tall peak at a particular frequency that we usually call the natural frequency or the, um, the resonant frequency of a system. And every system has one. And a good example of this is there, um, is there is, have you guys ever seen the Galloping Gertie Bridge disaster? It's a classic. So, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1950 something, 1940. So it's just a normal bridge, but even while they were building it, they noticed that this wave was building up in the bridge. At first it was just this tiny little wave, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, this is what that wave looked like. Got to the, and this is steel and concrete we're looking at here. Okay. It got so big that it was dangerous to even go on. It used to be a dare for college kids and stuff. They'd get in their car and race across it and see if they could get all the way across it. Eventually they closed it because it was so dangerous. At one point there was a professor that was going out to take some measurements on it. And he decided he couldn't drive his car back off. Of it, so he left his car out there. But you can see here that it got so bad that the roadway actually started to break apart. There's that professor's car, it's sitting right there. The roadway started to break up and eventually, there's a better picture of this car out there. You can actually see a picture of him. He's actually walking right on this line in the center. The center of the wave is always where there's no movement in the wave, right? And so he found the center of the wave and was right along the center of the road and he walked on that because that had very little movement. It was just kind of rocking back and forth. Whereas you can see on the sides, this thing is moving up and down on the sides 
20 feet, you know, maybe. Huge amounts. And it wasn't anything extreme. There was no earthquake. It was just the right amount of wind in the right way, at the right angle, just the right frequency of wind. The wind was just right to make it start rocking a little bit, but every time it made it rock, that next rock rocked on top of the last rock. It was like building one wave on top of another wave, or, and over several months, and I think it lasted uh, maybe a couple of years, but over the, the month, uh, however long the span was, there were those waves building up on each other day and night, day and night, it eventually got just too big to do anything with. And this was the end result in 1940. Look at that, that's just insane. So eventually it just shattered, it shattered the roadway, ripped up the cables, and fell to its doom. Crazy, crazy. So that's resonance. Resonant waves and forced resonances. It can be good or bad. If one other forced resonance is, you know, playing an instrument, you force a resonance and you force it to to uh, to resonate inside of a cavity, and then it sounds nice. It sounds loud or sounds beautiful, or whatever. Um, so resonance isn't always bad. In fact, your cell phone could never communicate with anything without resonance. Your cell phone is like a little. It's like a little electromagnetic resonator where it, it is looking for a very specific frequency of, of light out there, that we call, and it's a microwave type of light, um, and it's traveling from these cell towers all around, and it's looking for a specific frequency that it is tuned up to, so that your phone will resonate with that frequency, and then, that, then it, know, it recognizes that, and it accepts the signal and launches your app or you know, connects you to your text or whatever, and you receive a text or you receive a phone call. And that is also resonance. So resonance isn't necessarily bad. Let's see where we're going to go. So when does this oscillation become a wave? Well, it becomes a wave when it propagates. It becomes a wave when it goes from one, when, it, when the energy travels from one place to another. It's not necessarily the material that travels, it's the energy. So here's the example of the duck on the water. The wave is waving up and down, but it's traveling sideways. We call this a transverse wave because it's tra trans means across the line, or transverse means across the line. And so if, you're trans, if you have a transverse wave, that means it moves in one direction, in this case from left to right, and it waves, the wavy movement is just up and down. Some of the things that we need to realize is that the velocity of a wave is going to be equal to the, the length of a wave, wavelength, divided by its period. Why? Well, because every wave that passes by is a wavelength, and the period is the time that it passes in. So this is going to give you a distance over a time, and that's an actual, just flat out definition of velocity. The distance in the wavelength, the time is the period. Kind of funny to think about this. I like to think about the things floating on the lake or whatever, just bobbing up and down, bobbing up and down, never traveling in there. It's not exactly true because there is some friction between the objects in the water, which will cause them to move one way or the other and surf on them, I guess. Here we're going to calculate the wave velocity of the ocean wave. We have the distance between wave crests is 10 meters, and that's how you calculate the wave length. Look at the top of one wave and go to the top of the next wave and measure the distance. Those are the wave crests. And the 10 meters uh, is what we've got, and the time for a seagull to bob up and down is five seconds. And that's so that bobbing up and down time is essentially 
the seagull going from the maximum to the minimum part of the wave, right? It bobs up and down in five seconds, that's a period. So it's 10 meters divided by five seconds, two meters per second is the velocity of the waves, plain and simple. But there's another kind of a wave. Here's that transverse wave. It's waving up and down, but it's moving left to right. In a compression wave or a longitudinal wave, the waving happens in the same direction you're moving. So imagine that you, you've got a um, imagine that you've got a big long slinky, and somebody squeezes the slinky at one end and lets it go. Then a wave will travel through the slinky, but it's just going to it's just going to compress the slinky and decompress the slinky. It's not going to make it go up and down like this one. And that's what this person has done. They've compressed it and let it go, and that compression travels through the spring. Notice that the spring doesn't go anywhere. It's just that compression, that compressive uh, part right there ends up traveling down the way. But it's traveling in the same direction that it's, moved, that it's waving. So the waving is left to right, and it's moving from left to right. And then you can put a speaker over here if you wanted to connect this person to, uh, like, make this person into a microphone. And then they talk into the microphone and connect it to the slinky. And then the slinky transmits the sound. <laughs> Be kind of, that's kind of a stretch. But anyway, so the reason that I was saying that is because sound is a compression wave. So when we speak, we're actually compressing the air near us, and then that compression travels outward away from us. So this is very much a model for sound. If this was my mouth and the slinky was air, like this whole area was my, was my vocal, like my esophagus, the slinky would be the air, and the compressions in the air would be the sound waves traveling through the air. So sound is not an up and down wave, it is actually a compression wave. As so those compressions leave my mouth and travel outward from me, they hit your ear. And your ear feels those compressions, your eardrum does. And then, so that's why I want to throw that in there. That's where they the sound. And here they actually show, you create this wave in the string of the guitar, it creates waves of compression in the air which are resonating inside the, because this is an acoustic guitar, the acoustic guitar is designed to resonate with the waves, so then they just put a little speaker on it to connect to the speakers, and then we, that wave travels through the wire in, a, in the form of an electric wave, goes to the amplifier, the amplifier just makes a small wave into a big wave so that you can put it on a speaker and make a big sound. So this is kind of fun, we can create some waves. So here I've got, I've got this interesting thing where I got, I've got two movable objects. I can move either object, I think, or maybe not. But this one's locked in play. Oh, here we can do this. So this one I can move up and down and create different waves. If I create an upward wave like this and just let go, you notice that the upward wave travels over here until it hits this vice and then this vice this vice, uh, well, vice grip or vice clamp, pulls it down and so the wave goes to the bottom. So the wave starts on the top, like that, and then it flips it over and puts it on the bottom. And when you have something that is tied down on one end, that often happens because the clamp is going to pull back. If this thing is going upward, pulling, pulling on the string up, the clamp is going to pull it down. If pull it down, the clamp is going to pull it up. And notice that the waves Notice that the waves can actually hit in the middle. So if I send one wave like this and then another wave like this, you can actually notice where they hit in the middle, can't you? That's what we call superposition. And what happens when they hit in the middle? Like this one is going to be up, this one's going to be down. In the middle they actually kind of even each other out. The up one adds to the down one and it kind of flattens out for a second as they pass through each other. This passing through each other and those waves adding together to create a wave while they're passing to each other, through each other is called superposition. And superposition is essentially the adding of two waveforms in a very simple way. What happens if we loosen up the end here? If we loosen up the end, now it's just a ring on a pole. We do this. But look at that. It comes back. It goes up. comes back up. Because there was nothing to pull on this... this, this uh, there's no, nothing to pull on this ring over here to make it change direction. So if I pull up, the ring just slides up and sends the same way back. If I pull down, the ring just, pulls. The ring just kind of slides down and sends that way back underneath the string. 
And of course, if we just send it out the window, it just goes on and on forever. What do we want to talk about last year? So superposition. Now, interference is the re is the result wave when two when two waves um, superimpose when two waves pass each other and they kind of add to each other. If one is a positive five peak and no one's a negative five peak, you have a positive five plus a negative five will equal zero. But if both of them have positive five peaks, you're going to get a positive ten peak when they pass each other. And the new pattern that is formed is often called this interference pattern. So, and you can have two kinds of interference. You can have constructive interference where they add to make a bigger wave, either up or down. Or you can have destructive interference where they add together an equal zero wave because they cancel each other out. So here's two, here are two waves that are identical, same wave. Add them together, you just get a bigger wave that has the same wavelength, but it's just twice as tall because you added two of them together. But what happens if you have one that is going up when it crosses this axis, one that's going down the same amount? Well, this one up here is just the negative of this one down here, point for point, right? So you get a positive plus a negative, and the resultant wave or the interference results in a zero line, a flat line. And that can really happen in real life. It happens all the time. Where two waves come in and they interfere and just erase each other. But there's also situations where you have waves that have different wavelengths and different properties added together, like this big long wave that's kind of, you know, mostly to the right. But it's a very long wave compared to these. This is a very, very short wave. Add this very, very short wave, and what happens is the long wave just kind of gets bumpy, where you just add and end some things and subtract some things. This is actually um, kind of... This is kind of how radio works, or TV works, where you have a carrier wave, you have a wave that your TV has works on, the TV channel wave, whatever. So whatever channel you're watching, this is the wave of that channel. And then you superimpose this tiny little wave on top of it, and that tells you what the screen is supposed to look like. That gives you all the information to set up the screen, right? If either of those don't work, um, or they're off kilter, I think I'm skipping things. I'm like, in my head I'm saying one thing and I'm thinking another. I'm speaking too fast. So here we have this wave. Big, it's big on one side, big on this other side, longer here. And but, so we're pretending that we're looking at this on a screen. I don't think I said that at first, but I think I was talking about a screen. But anyway. Um, sorry, I'm moving so fast and I've got a million things in my brain and I'm tired. But, um, we've got the big wave and the little wave. We put them on top of each other. This is what we see, the resultant wave. This is the, um, this is the uh, interference wave, right? And if, we're, if this is a TV wave, we have this is our channel. Like this is the channel 11 wave, carrier wave. This would be all the stuff that needs to go on the screen and the sound that needs to go out the speakers. And we, put the, we superimpose these waves. We put them together. And this is, the wave that come, this is the wave that comes through the air to our house from the TV station. And then on our TV, we split these up. We take this wave out and we get this wave back. I mean, then maybe there's two or three waves sitting together on there. There might be the waves, you know, waves for the sound, the wave for the screen, or whatever else. And that's kind of how that works. In fact, it's even how cable TV works in kind of, in, in sort of the same way. Um, there's a little, it's a little more complicated, but essentially just waves coming down the wire instead of through the air. And then you have things called standing waves where you have, and standing waves are very well represented in the last section, I think. With our little wrench thing. So a standing wave can be created when you, cre when you have a disturbance in, a, in an object and it creates a wave, some kind of traveling, propagating bump or whatever. And then when it bounces off of something, it bounces back and builds on itself in such a way that it looks like the wave isn't moving. So it's very difficult to do sometimes. But here is a standing wave. 
Can you see how the wave doesn't necessarily look like it's moving left to right? And the green things aren't moving very much. It's mostly just the reds that's moving. If I get it to going the right speed, the greens are kind of staying where they are for the most part, and the red's doing the most moving. And I can, if, I, if, I'm really, if I'm really careful, I can make it bigger. So that's what that looks like. That's a standing wave. It looks, because it looks like it's standing. But standing waves are only created in specific circumstances. You have to have the, just the perfect length of the rope. You have to just, just the right weight of the rope. You have, to be, you have to be oscillating it at just the right frequency. It's very finicky, very picky. But it's something that we're quite used to doing. So here are some examples of some standing waves that are going to be added together. We have a standing wave from number one, standing wave number two, add them together, you get this resultant standing wave that essentially has twice as much amplitude. So if it's a sound wave, twice as much sound. Then you have the opposing ones, this one goes negative while this one goes positive, they can't stop. Um, here are two that are, you know, that go down first and then come up. And together you get this big wave and so on. But once you find that lowest frequency that, a, that an object will have a standing wave with, the lowest frequency standing wave or the longest wavelength standing wave, then you have found what we call the fundamental frequency of a system. Every system, ha every system that has vibrations of some kind or waves of some kind has a fundamental frequency which is the lowest frequency or the longest wavelength that can uh, create a standing wave inside that system. So we look at a very simple system, which is just a string tied between two walls with a length L between them. The length of the, the biggest wave you'll be able to make with this, in other words, the length of the fundamental wave, is going to be twice the distance between the two walls if the walls are not allowing the wave to move up and down with the walls. But you can create another wave with that that's a standing wave. You just go a little bit faster faster and you create another frequency, we call, in this case called the first overtone. Now let's take a look at that back with our wrench and clamp thing. So here's a frequency, this was the frequency that I said because I wanted to keep all those green things on the line, but what if I only want to keep one of the green things on the line? Then I have to find a wave that's going to be much slower, where just the green, the green one right in the middle stays on the line. I'm not doing so well, but I'm getting closer. There we go. So the green thing is moving, the, one, the green one in the middle is not moving very much anymore. It's moving up and down still a little bit, because I'm not great at this. We need to go even slower. I almost got it. It's about right there. You can see that I have a peak up on one side and down on the other side most of the time ish. It needs to be even slower. That's hard to do. There it is, about almost right there. There we go. Oh man. Anyway, the idea is to get, while well, this side's going up, this side's going down, and this thing in the middle just sits there. Right? That would be your fundamental frequency. And then your next available frequency, or your, that's, no, that's not quite, your, it's not quite your fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is this one, where there's no node in the middle. It's like playing jump rope, right? So there's the fundamental, like playing jump rope. And then if we go a little bit faster, we get a peak on each end, like this. And then we go a little bit faster, and we might get three peaks that are oscillating, and then four, and then five, right, and then six. And you know this if you you know this if you've ever played with a piece of string or a chain that there are just the, that perfect sweet spot where you get this great wave 
and all of a sudden it's a nice big wave. And it's a nice big wave because the wave coming down bounces off this clamp and comes and builds on the next wave coming down so that they build on each other and build on each other. Lots and lots of constructive interference. Uh, in any case, um, when you um, in any case when you do have two waves added together, you could you're never going to have perfect match with frequencies, and if you're off by just a little bit, you get this weird thing happening. So here are two frequencies that are very similar, but they're off just a little bit. When you add them together, you get these tall peaks and then these short peaks, and then these tall peaks and then these short peaks. And the result is that you get what we call the wah wah effect or the beat, beating effect. If two instruments are playing or two people are singing and they're singing at the same frequency but a little bit off from each other, then it starts to sound like, eh, 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 and it's really annoying, right? When people, people are, are playing or singing off a little, just a little bit off key, then it's this really annoying sound, and that, eh, eh, eh is the louder, softer, louder, softer, louder, softer of, this, of this, these added frequencies, right? So that's what we, we have some destructive parts and some constructive parts. It gets louder and then softer and louder and softer. Annoying to the musicians as well. How do we calculate that louder, softer frequency? Well, it's just the difference between the frequencies. And they do the math here, but here's what it comes out in the end. Take the difference in the frequency, take the absolute value, and that's going to be the frequency of the beat. So the faster the beat frequency, the closer the two frequencies are together. And the harder it is to hear that somebody's out of tune. Energy in waves. So energy is going to be associated with an intensity here. Um, so intensity of, of anything is measured by taking the power of it divided by the area. So the power over area gives you intensity. And how is that going to be related to anything with us? Well, let's, calculate, let's do some examples of intensity first. Here they're going to tell us the intensity on the Earth's surface is 700 watts per meter squared. And they want to know how much energy falls on a collector with this amount of area and this number of this amount of uh, time, this amount of hours. Well, since power is equal to energy over time, then that is actually um, what we're trying to get in part A is energy over time. So uh, they actually give us a couple of different things here. They give us the 700 watts per meter squared of intensity. So they give us the I, and they have the um, See, so they have the time for the, uh, if, you, if you take the power to be equal to energy over time, then um, that time is going to be four hours, right? And then in part B, they want to know what intensity would such a thing they'd have if concentrated by magnifying glass and air two times smaller to the moon, probably every group, right? And so they do this here. They calculate the power from the, they put the energy over time here for power. The area is given to us, the intensity is given, and they can count, they can solve for the amount of energy. They also do this at the end where they take the ratio of the intensity. So the energy the original intensity on the bottom, the final intensity on the top, and that gives you essentially the amount of uh, the amount of percentage of increase or decrease. Essentially. And they want to know here the combined intensity of two waves. So you have perfect constructive interference, which means the amplitude of your wave is going to add up to the amplitude of the other wave. Right? So you have this perfect constructive interference. They're identical waves, so they have the same intensity to begin with, but afterwards, what is the intensity of the resulting wave? Well, it turns out that it's going to be a squared thing. So if, uh, if your final intensity is double your initial intensity, it's gonna, you're gonna end up with this two x squared on the right-hand side, which is gonna be a four in the end, the factor of four. So 
Um, you just have to be aware of that because of because inside of this equation for i is something that is uh, squared, the lot in the area. Here's an example of using speakers to have places where you have uh, interference and you'll have louder noises in some parts of the room with the peaks of the noise add up to each other and then softer noises where the peaks add to the troughs and cancel out. It's constructive and destructive interference with speakers. You ever wonder why if you go to a concert there's like a million speakers in the wall? They're trying to kill out all the dead spots on the floor. They never quite get it done because every time you put a new speaker in you might cover this spot but you might actually destructively interfere with these two spots and create problems. So it's no easy solution. And that takes us all the way through that chapter in a quick hurry. Now, homework. Most of this is about looking at waves and doing some things with it. So for example here, what are the first four times after zero which the object passes through its equilibrium point? Well, the equilibrium point is at this zero point here in the middle. So you have this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. This time. So you kind of have to guess. This is about halfway between 0 0.3, so it's about 1, 0.15, right? What are the first four times after zero which the object has maximum magnitude displacement from equilibrium? Here's a maximum at zero, but they want to know after zero, so this one, this one, this one, and you'll have to guess on the next one. So on and so forth. Um, here is one with the pendulum. He's he creates a pendulum on Earth that has certain properties. Plug those properties into the pendulum equation to figure out everything about the pendulum. And then use the pendulum equation to change where the pendulum is. Maybe he's going to take it to the moon, where you have one sixth g for your gravity. And then you have to plug that new g into the, into the pendulum equation to get a new period. And that's what they want to do there. Here's a standing wave problem, right? Here is the, fun, here is the um, this is not the fundamental because it has this place where it crosses in the middle, right? The fundamental just goes straight from here over here like a jump rope, right? This is what we call the first harmonic. And it has a node, that, that place where the string doesn't move is a node. There's one node there, this is a one, two, three, four nodes here, right? The fundamental frequency has zero nodes, but apparently here, there's a node here, and a node here, and a node here. And that does happen in real waves. Where, and you might even get both of these waves on top of each other. In fact, they, they mix these waves to create different sounds on synthesizers. So a violin has a certain mixture of these waves. And they synthesize that mixture of waves and come up with a sound that sounds like an hour. So here is a uh, toy car with a spring on it, and somebody pulls it and lets it go, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Again, spring, scale, subramon, crossover. Here they have uh, frequencies of different notes in music, and they want you to calculate the wavelength. That's easy enough. This tells you how many disturbances are made every second and how far apart these things. So this four times a second is going to be essentially your hertz, your frequency. Four, four, four hertz is your frequency because it creates a wave four times every second. And then the wave crests are 0 0.016 meters apart. Well, that tells you the wavelength. Right? So you know wavelength, you know frequency, calculate B, calculate T. And lots of questions like this over and over. Here, they, here this one is actually not technically person, you know, greater related, but I didn't anyway. You have, you, have, uh, you have a person on in, out the mountains and they see the lightning and then they hear the thunder later. We're going to assume that the lightning, is, the light from the lightning travels instantaneously to you because it's so much faster than sound, it's pretty much instantaneous. And then after you, um, after you see the lightning, 
you hear the sound some time later. Here you're going to calculate the distance to the lightning bolt. And so on. All right, I think we're done. It's good. We're getting tired and burned out. So tomorrow we'll have a lab. Learn more about waves. Get some homework done so you can ask questions tomorrow as well. And we'll finish up uh, this chapter this week and start a new chapter on sound and hearing next week and be done. Have a good day. <clears throat>